right. it's, uh, it's exciting to have uh, all of the new members. You, you only saw half of the new members, so there were twice as many new members today, which uh, I feel like is miraculous given the year that we have walked through that <laughs> we, we added 16, I believe, was the number today. Um, yeah, we, we weren't even meeting at this time last year, uh, so pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, I uh, told the first service, it was about five years ago that I stood on the stage and Tim asked me the question, why did you choose to make Helltown your church home? And I said, tongue in cheek, I wanted to be eligible for church discipline. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, back then, there was all, it was dead silent. No one knew whether or not to laugh or not. Now, now you know me, at least to some degree. But that is true. I, I do feel like one of the primary benefits of church membership is church discipline. And I know that feels emotionally and mentally out of place. Why, why, why would that be one of the top benefits of church membership? Because our hearts are prone to wander, as the hymn writer says. And we need the body of Christ and the leadership within the body to continually help us to check that propensity to wander. And to say, hey, you're stepping in areas that you are going to regret if you don't come back under the will and the word of God. And you desperately need the care of the shepherds that God has ordained to watch over your souls. Uh, so if, uh, if you have uh, joined today, then congratulations. You're now eligible for church discipline. Um, if, if you haven't, I would encourage you to make that step. Uh, there is something very good about asking the shepherds, the elders, to watch over you in a formal capacity, uh, to guard your souls. We are going to be in, ooh, that's not the, not the right text. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6 this morning. Uh, it is page 862 in the Pew Bible. Uh, if you're using that one, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36, page 862 in the Pew Bible. There's much of life that is not like the brochure. Generally, it's, it's big items. Um, marriage, uh, not, not quite like the brochure. Um, I, I would assume that for our military members, military, not, not quite like the brochure. You, you definitely uh, get the uniform and the, uh, the educational benefit, but there are some other aspects of it that you weren't quite anticipating, I'm sure. For me, parenting is the one that for sure hits home, that that one's definitely not like the brochure. I like to say I was a better parent before I became one. I used to, before we had kids, I used to be able to be out at dinner with my wife, uh, enjoying uh, the freedom that I didn't know I was having at the moment, and looking at some poor sap of a father or mother, as the case may be, dealing with a child that was unruly and out of control, and, and I could look at it and just spout off to my wife about the wisdom that I had and how a simple, simple solution here would be for the parent to do this, and obviously the child is feeling this way, and voila, it's solved. That doesn't happen anymore. I had children, and uh, I became an idiot. Uh, I have no more wisdom when it comes to parenting. Uh, I'm uh, desperately seeking the help of anyone uh, that, that does have wisdom. Um, fortunately, I'm on staff with two guys that uh, actually are, are great fathers. Um, but, yeah, I, I was looking forward to the, you know, the, the uh, ball games and uh, the birthday parties and going to get ice cream and teaching them to love meat cooked with fire. Um, and generally proclaiming most of the time that I am the greatest dad of all time. And a few of those things have happened. Uh, but in general, I find parenting to be exhausting and um, difficult and challenging. And discipline is not nearly as clear-cut as I thought it was going to be. 
it's really not anything like the brochure. You might say that becoming a parent is the easy part. Being a parent, that is the hard part. Right? Becoming a parent, piece of cake. That is like the brochure. Being a parent, not so much. The Christian life is actually fairly similar to that. Becoming a Christian, that's the easy part. So just simply the ABCs. Uh, the, the, the youth have learned it like the back of their hand, right? You admit you're a sinner, you believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, you confess that you desperately need him as Savior and Lord. God asks nothing of you to become a Christian other than you submit your life to him, place your faith in his work. But once you are a Christian, things get more challenging. See, he asked for nothing from you to contribute to the debt that you owe. You, you owe, right? It's way up there. None of us can get to it. He asked us to contribute nothing when it came to the debt that our sin created in our hearts and lives. But in buying that debt, he bought us, and we are now bond slaves of his. And Luke chapter 6, particularly the latter half, Jesus addresses it to his disciples. If you look there in verse 20, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Let's read what he has to say in verses 27 to 36 as the ideal Christian living. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. The word of the Lord. This section, uh, and if you include the, the uh, remaining portion of chapter 6, and even the portion that Tim preached on last week, is really a section that is describing Christian living. Uh, at its base and at its finest. It's the same thing. He addresses it to his disciples. And if you recall last week, Tim took us through the various blessings and woes that Jesus walks through as well. And Tim, I think, eloquently stated that there are really two different camps or two different people that are summarized in the value systems of those blessings and woes. There, there is the poor and the hungry and the sad and the unpopular. And they're blessed for being such. And then there's the rich and the fat and the happy and the popular. And Jesus says, you really want to be careful in this category. Not because uh, being wealthy or because being full uh, or happy or popular are necessarily bad things. But remember, our heart is prone to wander. And the category over here of poor and hungry and sad and unpopular better represents our actual spiritual condition. 
And when we camp in this side and we make those our values, or rather we make sure that the others aren't our values, then we are better poised to need God, to be desperate for him, and to be concerned or fearful, rightly, of our own depraved hearts that are naturally inclined and drawn to the riches and the wealth and the popularity and the happiness. Because who doesn't want to be on this side? Right? This, this is the better side. I like a Tesla like everybody else does, all right? This is the better side. In the book of Daniel, chapter 1, Daniel resolves not to defile himself with the king's food or with the king's wine. And we tend to assume that the reason he chooses not to do this is because the food has been sacrificed to idols and therefore he doesn't want to defile himself with that. The problem is that any people group, including Israel, that sacrificed things to idols also sacrificed grains and fruits and vegetables. So the likelihood that the grains and the fruits and the vegetables that Daniel ate were also sacrificed to idols is probably accurate. And in that conundrum of a situation of trying to figure out, well, why is it that Daniel decides, no, I'm not going to do this? I think Sinclair Ferguson offers the best reading of it. He surmises that Daniel says, you know, I'm concerned that I am going to be tempted to enjoy all of the comforts of this kingdom of Babylon. And the first place I can see it starting is with bacon. It smells good, it looks good, but I'm afraid if I go down that road, I may be tempted towards other things, things that are sinful, things that are idolatrous. I may actually, rather than just simply eating meat sacrificed to idols, I may find myself worshiping one if I don't make sure that I maintain my discipline in this one basic mundane category. Jesus says that type of value system is what leads to a blessed life. It's not nearly as fun <laughs> to be on the poor and the hungry and the sad and the unpopular side but it's safe. The other side is playing with fire. Now, we come to our section this morning, and I think Jesus wisely understands our proclivity to justify ourselves. See, he has created two categories of people and has said, this is the better one. Be this one. And the problem with my heart, and I presume yours, is that when I'm in a category that God has said, it doesn't get any better than this, I can look at the other category and begin to think less of them. Begin to judge them. In the telling of the Good Samaritan, a man says to Jesus after Jesus says that you should love your neighbor as yourself, the text says, wanting to justify himself. He asked, yeah, but Jesus, who really is my neighbor? There is a proclivity in our hearts to divide and to see that other side as somehow less than us, somehow more evil than us somehow more prone to be uh, deceived or drawn into sin or idolatry. But remember, this category here, the poor and the hungry and the sad and the unpopular, that's the one that we should camp in because that one best captures and describes our internal spiritual condition. We are just as needy and desperate as the other crowd. And we remain that way, needing God to continually work on our hearts as he sanctifies us, causes us to become like him in righteousness. 
And so Jesus says, hey, don't deceive yourselves into thinking that you're the awesome group and this other group is one that you can disregard or discard. That you can actually begin to grow in your hatred for. It's exactly what the Pharisees did. God, I I am so thankful that I'm not like those Gentiles. And there's something in our hearts that wants to justify ourselves. And so Jesus pleads with us, no, don't, don't hate them. In fact, Matthew captures the, the true leanings of our hearts. The book of Matthew captures it. Luke, for some reason, doesn't give it to us. When, when Jesus says, but I say to you, there in verse 27, we know from other accounts that Jesus has actually quoted some other teaching, some rabbinic teaching. And the one that he quotes in the book of Matthew is, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus says, no, that's not what the law says and that's not what I say. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. And this is not, anyone who's been around uh, the church for a good amount of time knows that there are different Greek words for love. There's storge and phileo that are more of a family type of love, affinity, affection for another. There's eros, which is a more romantic form of love. And there's agape, which is an unconditional sort of love. It's the love that the father has for the son and the son has for the father. And it is the same love that Jesus calls us to give to our enemies. What do they look like? Well, it's in the next phrase. They hate you. It's not just people that you don't necessarily get along with or, you know, people who cheer for the cowboys. Yep. They hate you. Now, they don't hate you because of dumb stuff that you do, at least Hopefully, it's, it's not, you know, neighborly disputes of, well, I actually think that the property line is here, and he thinks it's here, but, well, we can't get along because, like, those seven inches are really important. No, it, it's something different altogether. See, it, it actually, Jesus points to it back in verse 22. Yeah, blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, they hate you because of Christ. Why would anyone do that? Well, because we have an offensive message. It's simply offensive to say, hey, um, just so you know, you're a sinner and uh, you're completely lost and destined for hell uh, without God uh, covering you in his righteousness. That, that is an offensive message to tell someone that they're depraved. Even if we, but, but there's hope, right? It's an offensive message. And quite frankly, there are some people in this category Right, of the rich, of, the, of the, the well-fed, of the popular, that are going to say, you know what, I think you're right, and I see something in that value system that's attractive, and I'm interested in that. But the vast majority of this group, Jesus says, the way's narrow that leads to life. It's a giant, gaping path that leads to destruction. The vast majority of this group doesn't want to hear that message. When I was in college, I had a friend uh, who was hanging out with an acquaintance of mine. Um, 
And uh, he, he, they both decided to go do something, and my friend said, hey, let's call Greg and see if he wants to come. And this other person said, can we not bring Greg? He's no fun. Now, I know that that's hard for you to believe that anyone would ever even deign to assume that I'm not fun. But that's what this person said. And my friend said, no, Greg's convicting. I wish we'd all be that way. I wish I'd be that way. Uh, for some reason, I was much more convicting in college than I am now, but uh, I wish that we would live a dedicated life that values these things all the time, that really challenges this group to say, there's something there. But the majority of that group is simply going to hate you. And there's implicit in this section here the idea that Jesus doesn't actually come out and say, but this is basic, normal, everyday Christian living. The kind that if you're a disciple, you do this. You choose poverty and uh, hunger and I can't remember the list anymore. I've done so good at it uh, up until now. Unpopularity, those things. You can live in that space that Jesus says, you're blessed to live in this space. And you can still make enemies. That's something that's difficult for us to take when we feel like, man, we're just rocking it spiritually and then all of a sudden, some difficulty or struggle or trial or tribulation comes. We, for some reason, act surprised and wonder, God, what's going on? Why does this person hate me? No, it's actually working. You're doing what you're supposed to. And if you're doing what you're supposed to, expect that you are going to make enemies. And when you do, love them with the same love that the Father has for you and the same love that the Father has for his Son. Jesus calls on us to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who abuse us, to literally go to the throne room of grace on behalf of those who hate us, to plead on their behalf before God who they are shaking their fist at. That's the love that God calls us to exercise on their behalf. Now, how far does that go? Well, verse 29 is a good indication. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, don't withhold your tunic either. I want to pause for a brief second and just address a... a what I feel like is a giant elephant over here. Uh, we, we went from the last phrase in 28, pray for those who abuse you, uh, to verse 29, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And I think, rightly, we might question, so if I'm in an abusive situation or relationship, I'm just supposed to pray for them and hang tight um, or r roll over and you know, t take a beating from the other side. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus is saying here. If you're in an abusive situation, uh, I, I, I would encourage you to seek assistance in any way, shape, or form you possibly can, starting with, come talk to one of your pastors about it. You shouldn't be there. So, if if we aren't to take this literally, then do we take any of the rest of it literally, or how does that, how does that work? Well, I, I would say that Jesus is actually pretty good at speaking in hyperbole. He tends to say big outlandish things that are going to shock and to make us think and mull over what's his point here. He, he says things like, hey, if your eye offends, just rip it out, throw it away from you. Your hand, cut the thing off and cast it away. Peter says, 
Jesus, should I forgive my brother seven? Seven times sounds good. And Jesus says, let's go with 70 times seven. His point is not Peter there just making the tally marks, right? Up All the way up until 490. His point is, how about beyond reasonable to keep track of? And Jesus is essentially saying the same thing here. Now, in ancient Near Eastern culture, one of the most offensive things you could do to another human being is backhand them with your right hand on the right side of their face. And that's what we have here. It actually, in certain circumstances, it was a, uh, a punishable um, offense. Uh, you could actually be taken to, to court and tried over it. And so Jesus shows us here an example of uh, just utter shame in the public square. Someone who's been uh, struck on the side of the face and says, hey, don't worry about your honor. Just turn your cheek. And then the next thing, he says, anyone who takes your cloak, don't withhold your tunic. Well, if you know anything about ancient Near Eastern dress, the cloak is the outer garment, and the tunic is the inner garment. And there's not anything under the tunic. So if my cloak is gone and my tunic is gone, I am naked. And that's also a hugely shameful experience in ancient Near Eastern culture. It's actually a pretty shameful one in this culture. But in that one, it's utterly shameful. And so then I would ask the question again, Jesus, how far should I take my love? How great can the hostility and the hate be from my enemy? And I think Jesus says, uh, to utter shame and embarrassment, even in the public square, the utter ruining of your image. That's pretty far. Well, Jesus, how, how, do I do, how do I do that? How do I allow that sort of suffering unjustly remind you, right? I, I'm, I'm suffering this way because I'm being a good Christian. Well, I think Jesus gives us the answer. He takes a, a slight shift here. Verse 30 says, Give to everyone who begs from you. Again, ancient Near Eastern culture is very interested in personal responsibility. There aren't people that beg in that culture that can work. Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians, right? If, if you don't work, you don't eat. So those who are begging are begging because they have no other option. It's not that they're unemployed or underemployed. They are unemployable. They have some disability or disadvantage. They are lame or blind or leprous or have some other disease that prevents them from actually being able to work. And so they are begging because they have no other resource. And Jesus gives us a window into the type of heart posture that allows us to love our enemies even when they shame us in the public square. He says, the person who's able to give to the one who begs is able to do that. Why? Because the person who begs in that culture, they have no prospect of ever getting a, 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 a C-level position at some uh, you know, startup software company. They're never going to just happenstance into a major Bitcoin score. They are beggars for life. They are never going to pay back whatever I give them. When I give it to them, I will never see it again. And Jesus says the heart posture of the person that lives this way, open-handed, open-handed with my stuff, open-handed with my honor, open-handed with what people think of me, open-handed with what I eat. The person that lives that way 
is the one that's able to give love without end to the person who hates. And then Jesus says, you know what? Even one who takes away your goods, don't demand those back. Why? Because I live this way. I live like the Christians in Hebrews 10 who joyfully welcomed the plundering of their property. Because, you know what? You're more blessed if you're poor and hungry and sad and unpopular. Because at least then you're reminding yourself of the true condition of your heart. And so Jesus says, if you need just a a simple phrase, a one-liner that helps you remember exactly what you're supposed to do, I'm going to give you this thing that we're going to call the golden rule. Just treat everybody the way you want to be treated. Simple enough, right? Indulge me. What, What are some ways that you would like to be treated? Go ahead. I won't bite. Kind. Patient. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. Yeah, I I wrote down three. Patient, understanding, and generous. I really want people (laughs) to acknowledge, yeah, you've got some faults, but that's okay. You try your best, and even when you don't, we get it. And then from that position, to be generous with me. Not just with stuff and bacon, but also just generous of spirit, right? Of thinking, and I I really want this from my wife and children, he's the best of all time. That's why I remind them over and over and over again, I fix the TV. I will, they, they ask me, how, how long are you going to tell us that you fix the TV? I fixed the TV at least six years ago. And I, we don't even have that TV anymore. <laughs> and I bring it up all the time. And I'm going to continue to bring it up all the time. You know why? Because I want my family to be generous with me. Just like that. And you know what? I'm not any different than this crowd, than the one that's rich and full and happy and popular. They want your patience and understanding and generosity. So Jesus uh, almost anticipates a question. He says, if you love those who love you, and if you are good to those who are good to you, and if you are uh, lending to those who are going to lend to you, what benefit is that? I mean, even the sinners do that. Well, I, I, I don't want to be the contrarian here, but I mean, there's a lot of benefit. Uh... I I like friends. Uh, I enjoy hanging out with Pavel and um, giving him a hard time about being Russian. Um, And he enjoys giving me a hard time about... Yes. Yeah, being white. There you go. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I, I like having friends. And, you know, having friends means that I get to make other friends. And there's this nice community that's developed. And... We enjoy uh, various experiences and affinities of watching football games together and things like that. And You know, if I uh, lend to those who also lend to me, well, that means that there's probably some nice financial incentives and gain that are happening, and I'm probably increasing in wealth. There's benefit. Make no mistake about it. This side's more attractive. 
But Jesus implies there's not really any benefit. And why is that? Because nothing over here lasts at all. He summarizes his points in verse 35. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And then he gives us the most important reason for why we do anything we ever do. It's the reason that we forgive. It's the reason that we celebrate beauty. It's the reason that we honor marriage and the family. It's the reason that we extend grace. It's the reason that we love our enemies, that we do good to those who hate us, and that we lend to those we never expect to receive back from. It's because God does that. Just read through 27 to 31 and just lay it over the top of the crucifixion story of the passion Jesus loved his enemies, those who hated and reviled him. When they cursed him, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He was struck and beaten and whipped and crucified. His clothes were taken from him. All because you and I are beggars. Not necessarily for monetary things, but there is a debt that we owe that we could never pay, that Jesus paid on our behalf. Our sin eternally separates us from the God we have sinned against. But there's hope even in that desperate situation the shadow of the valley of death, there is hope because Jesus looked down, the Father looked down on us and sent his Son to be kind to the ungrateful and the evil, as it says right there in verse 35. Why do we love our enemies? Because God loves his enemies. You would be his enemy. If you are if if you are redeemed, repentant for your sins, trusting in the work of Christ on the cross for salvation, you aren't a beggar anymore. But you were. And if, as Alistair Begg says, God loved us because he loved us, if he had not done that, you would still be an enemy. Our culture right now is fantastic at creating an us versus them scenario with respect to anything. Uh, if, if, you, if you just right now go to Fox News and CNN or MSNBC.com, you can see who's on whose team. Right? It, it lays it out really, really clearly. I had someone come up to me after the first service and say, you know, m- the person I have the hardest time with, and some of you will laugh at this, but I, I get it. The person I have the hardest time with loving my enemy is Nancy Pelosi. There are people in our government on both sides, that some of you find it hard to love, hard to bless in the midst of their cursing, hard to pray for in the midst of their at least perceived abuse. There's a situation in Minneapolis, maybe you've heard of it. There are people on all sorts of sides of the spectrum that 
is the Floyd Chauvin thing. And I fear that we have been sucked into all of the various aspects that our culture is picking and choosing. While I can't love them or see them as a fellow human being that shares the image of God and that, that God actually, yep, there it is, is kind to, even if they're ungrateful. They're ungrateful and evil. I can't, no, no, God says you, you, should, you should love them. You should love George Floyd's family and Derek Chauvin. You should love Sean Hannity and Mika Brzezinski. I know that's radical. Stop buying into the side choosing. Love the people who wear masks. Love the people who don't wear masks. Jesus says, you, you were all enemies at one point, and I loved you because I loved you. Let me just close with the imperative that Jesus leaves us with in verse 36. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Let's pray. Father, we do not deserve the grace and the mercy and the love that you have shown to us. Even before we were your children, you caused the sun to rise and set and the rain to fall, even on those of us who were ungrateful and evil. And now we find ourselves having become your children to be nothing more than unworthy slaves. And so, Father, I pray that you would work into our hearts the ability to live life with open hands, not needing to get ours, but to love you and to follow your example of loving even our enemies. I ask this through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen.